So this week's lab, lab number five, is kind of what I like to call a multitasking lab because we're pretty much going to be performing three different tasks. So remember last week in our lab, uh, lab number four, what we did was isolate the plasmid from one bacterial cell line. And now this week we're going to be putting it into a new bacterial cell line. So not only are we going to do that process of transformation, but we're also going to make sure that we check and confirm that the plasmid has the insert that we think it does. So we'll do a double digest, and then we'll need to be able to visualize that, so we'll do agarose gel electrophoresis for that. So this image just kind of gives us an overview of kind of what the lab is going to entail, and this is part of the reason why this pre-lab is worth 50 points, a lot more than we've seen before, because I'm having you watch and listen to this pre-lab presentation kind of beforehand as part of your uh, pre-lab. And uh, the reason is, is there is a lot that's going on in uh, this week's lab. So this little graphic, and you'll have kind of an expanded version of this that you'll get in class, which kind of walks through uh, the play-by-play -play in terms of what you should think about doing. And this is kind of something you might want to think about as you begin doing independent research. Um, that to make efficient use of your time, anytime you have something that's sort of a passive situation where you're not really actively doing something, you might want to consider um, overlapping that with another task where you could be doing something more active. So there's three basic things that we're going to be doing today, and we'll break these apart and kind of talk about them in detail. The first is we're going to talk about doing a transformation. So again, this is where we're taking a bacterial cell and we're introducing a plasmid to it. So we're going to take the plasmid that you guys isolated in our last lab, and then we're going to transform it into a new bacterial cell. So we'll talk about the details of that. Um, we're also then going to be doing, in a second experiment, we're going to be doing what's called a double digest, which basically means we're going to take that plasmid and we're going to use restriction enzymes as molecular scissors to cut out the insert that we had there and then basically um, run that on an agarose gel. So that's kind of the uh, part two to that uh, process and we're going to visualize what we see there and see if we see what we'd expect. So again, this lab is all about the concept of multitasking. So we use kind of the example of a Thanksgiving dinner, right? The, the idea that nobody sits there and says, today is turkey day, I'm going to make the turkey today uh, because I can't think about cooking anything else at the same time that I'm cooking a turkey. No, what you really need to do, and most people who plan meals like this, they will coordinate what time does something need to be started so that at 5 o'clock everything is all ready to be uh, to be enjoyed at the same time. And the same is true here with our experiments. So we're going to walk through again some details for what we need to do and as we go through this pre-lab uh, there'll be a few questions that you need to answer and those questions will be related to what you need to think about providing in written form on your pre-lab that gets turned in on Blackboard. So again a little bit of a review here and I'm going to highlight some important things that will um, that will come up again in our lab. This is just kind of what we call a plasmid map of our, uh, our MGH plasmid. And we're going to talk again about some important aspects of our plasmid map or our plasmid today. Remember there was three important kind of uh, basic features to a plasmid. We have an ampicillin resistance gene, so we'll have some type of a selectable marker that we'll see in our plasmids. So that's one thing that we'll kind of um, talk about its use uh, today. You're going to have um, something here in our multi-cloning site that we're not actually going to utilize in today's class, but I want to teach you about what it does. And so again, anytime you see these arrows here, they represent a gene. So one of the things that I kind of want you to imagine and think about is when we have an arrow that looks like this, what we have is an intact gene. And that gene is going to um, perform some sort of function. And we'll talk about what that function is a little bit later. But the idea is, is that if we add in our insert, and in our case, it's going to be the MGH insert, what's going to happen is it's going to disrupt this gene. 
And uh, again, I hope that makes sense where if you just literally think about putting something in and kind of breaking apart this here because we've introduced something into this multi-cloning site, right? Our multi-cloning site is up here. If we introduce something into the multi-cloning site, we're gonna disrupt this gene that we have here. And now that gene is not going to be able to do its, its function and make an intact protein. So we'll talk about a way that we can utilize that um, in molecular cloning. Not again something we're going to see with this lab in particular, but it is something that can be useful for, um, for doing kind of plasmid work. So we will spend time talking about this ampicillin resistant gene, and again this is going to allow us to separate bacteria with and without plasmids. So separate bacteria with and without plasmids. And we'll see how that works in just a little bit. So again, a little bit of background on our gene of interest, and just to kind of highlight, this is going to help you with pre-lab question one. M stands for malic dehydrogenase. And so one of the things you'll have to think about for pre-lab question one is how many amino acids uh, that is. There's lots of references you can find for malic dehydrogenase. We're actually going to be getting our malate dehydrogenase from watermelon. That's just the gene that we got it from. Um, but size ranges for malate dehydrogenase, if you were to look it up in the literature, is basically anywhere from 310 to 350 amino acids. And then again, to determine the number of nucleotides that would be coded by a certain protein, you just multiply by three, right? So multiplying by three allows us to utilize the genetic code, right? The genetic code says that every three nucleotides are gonna code for one amino acid. So if we multiply the number of amino acids by three, that will tell us the number of nucleotides that will need to be present in the gene. So again, if we kind of consider what's um, going on here, if we're looking at having an average here of 330, if we kind of wanted to multiply here, we'd get that there's 990 nucleotides that would be in the M portion of our target gene. Kind of taking through and doing the same thing for the G, again, which stands for the green fluorescent protein. Um, that's actually a protein that's talked about in your textbook. So 238 amino acids multiplying by three gives us 714. And then H there stands for the uh, six histidine residues. So we've got that his six tag. So again, six amino acid residues are going to be coded for by 18 nucleotides. If we add all of these up, we get an approximate size of our insert of 1722. And kind of if we think about what's going on here and we flip back to our plasmid, our plasmid was 3.4 kilobases. And so if we then take and add in, in this spot, our insert, which we're saying is about 1,700 nucleotides, we can get the full size of the plasmid. And just again to highlight what we're going to think about in the future, right? If we're going to cut out our insert from right here, what's that going to that is going to allow us to do is say, you know what? If we cut this piece out, we should see something on our gel that is about 1,722 nucleotides, and then we should see a plasmid piece that's shortened by that amount. So again, that type of information should help you get through pre-lab question number one. So again, putting this together uh, in, in a picture here, and this is an image that we're going to see as we kind of walk through this presentation here, that um, our MGH plasmid, again, is going to have an antibiotic resistance gene, which in our case it's going to be an ampicillin resistance gene. We're going to have our gene of interest, so that's shown with red here. So again, our MGH insert is predicted to be about 1.7 kilobases. And one of the things that we don't actually have in our plasmid, but we're going to talk about how it works, is if we had a lac Z gene. So this dark blue uh, region just kind of shown right here, over here and here. If that dark blue region was intact, we would have a lac Z gene this LAC-Z gene here that would allow us to have a functioning LAC-Z protein. So we'll talk about what that is and how that might come into play with how you would think about doing some, some neat tricks with plasmid cloning, but not anything that we're going to think about um, doing specifically for our lab. Okay, so moving on to kind of um, revisit some of the things we did last um, last time is thinking about what we're actually doing here with different kinds of bacteria. So to highlight, this is going to help you answer pre-lab question three. 
but to just revisit um, the different kinds of work that we're going to be doing. When we want to manipulate, store, isolate, purify plasmids, we're going to want to be doing that with the E. coli DH5-alpha, and that's what we did last week, right? Our last lab, lab number four, is we isolated our plasmid from E. coli DH5-alpha. Now because we want to move on and begin doing some protein work, what we need to do is think about utilizing a different cell line, so that E. coli BL21DE3 cell line, and that's going to allow us to then overexpress and purify um, uh, our protein. And so this lab is again going to take the plasmid that we isolated from lab 4, it's going to transform it into a different cell line, so this E. coli BL21DE3 cell line, and then we'll be able to then in the interim between uh, lab five and then lab seven, you guys will have a dry lab where you'll learn about uh, cell pur or protein purification. I'll be doing the overexpression and preparation of the cell lysate for you in that interim time. So again, pre-lab question three asks you to think about why we have these two different cell lines and how we can um, utilize them to do different kinds of work in the lab. So again, some themes that we talk about in uh, biochemistry are how do I separate and isolate what I want from what I don't want? And so two terms that we're going to introduce in this pre-lab are the concept of preparative tools and analytical tools. So I just kind of want to highlight, when we're talking about something done in a preparative way, it's generally going to be large scale. So you're going to basically be using all of your material and the reason you're doing that is you're going to have some type of a downstream use. So you're going to be doing something else with your material later on. So you basically want to take all of it, do something with it to clean it up, modify it, do something with it, because you're going to be using the entirety of it um, as we move downstream here. So I just kind of want to orient you to what we're seeing in this, uh, in this image that we have right here. So this is going to kind of represent what we do when we do transformation. And again, transformation is going to be a preparative um, sort of a, a process. We're going to be kind of taking the, what we have from this experiment and, and using it downstream. And so what we can see here is these kind of uh, cartoons represent different kinds of bacteria. And what we're going to see is there's going to be three situations that are possible. And I'm just going to highlight here that we're only going to really have two that we're working with in our situation. I'll kind of highlight the one that we're not going to see here. But we have kind of different situations um, depending on what's inside these plasmids. And so uh, you have untransformed bacteria. So bacteria that don't take up any... Um, any, back, uh, any plasmid are going to be shown here um, not containing any plasmid. So this is an untransformed bacteria, that's an untransformed bacteria, and that's not what we're interested in. Okay, What we want are E. coli that have our plasmid. So for right now, don't worry about the difference between recombinant and unchanged plasmids because that's not something that we're dealing with here. I'm going to tell you about kind of how that might arise and how we might distinguish between these, but just keep in mind that that's not something that we see with our MGH plasmid. Okay, so what we're going to have here is we're going to have bacteria that get transformed, and any bacteria that gets transformed is going to have a plasmid with it, which means it's going to be able to have antibiotic resistance. Okay. And so for right now, we're only going to have a, a binary situation. We're going to have E. coli that have plasmid, and then in terms of things that we don't want, we're going to have um, E. coli that lack a plasmid. Again, those are untransformed. So we're going to need to think about how do I separate and isolate what I want, the bacteria that have plasmid, from what I don't want, the bacteria that don't have any plasmid. Again, this situation that we have down here, where um, we have unchanged plasmids, it's going to be very unlikely here. So again, our situation is that we're not going to be having this, but recombinant plasmids or plasmids or bacteria that contain plasmids is kind of our target situation here. All right, so again, thinking about how do I isolate what I want from what I don't want, what we're going to basically utilize is an antibiotic here. So this antibiotic is going to allow us to separate bacteria that have plasmids from bacteria that don't. 
because remember, any bacteria that has a plasmid is going to have this antibiotic resistance gene. And if it has the antibiotic resistance gene, if we add in antibiotics into our cell culture, any bacteria that don't have a plasmid are going to be subject to the activity of the antibiotic and they're not going to survive. So again, antibiotic screening will allow us to separate what we want from what we don't want. So E. coli that lack a plasmid are going to die because they don't have the ability to produce a protein that allows them to evade that bacteria. Um, and again, what we won't have in our situation, but we're going to kind of talk about it, this is not going to be here, so not lab number five, but I am going to just kind of highlight for you what um, we can do to separate, for example, uh, bacteria that have the plasmid with the insert and then bacteria that have a plasmid that don't have an insert. And again, that's not going to be our situation here because we didn't actually put our gene into the plasmid. If that was something that we had done, and it might be something that we'll tackle next semester as we make mutations and so forth in our, in our, uh, in our proteins, we might have a situation where we need to make a new plasmid and we need to put an insert into a plasmid. And in that case, you might have a situation where you have plasmids that don't have an insert and plasmids that do. And we need a way to be able to separate those. So I'm going to tell you here how that actually works. And it's a process called blue-white screening. So remember back here when we kind of talked about um, the different things that we had in our plasmid, right? If we have this intact gene here, if the gene is intact, we're going to be able to have that gene product be made. But if we put our insert in the middle of that gene, then that gene is no longer fully functional. So we can utilize that in the lab as a way to separate. Okay. So what we're going to see here is, again, if we have this intact gene, okay, what this is going to do is allow us to make a protein that allows us to turn a substrate blue. Okay. So again, if we have plasmids that don't contain that red insert and they're contained in a bacteria, we won't be able to get rid of those by adding an antibiotic, but we will be able to visualize them and they will be distinct on a plate from bacteria that have that insert. So again, I'm going to say this again, so hopefully this makes sense here. Both of these bacteria would be able to grow in the presence of antibiotic, but this plasmid would not contain our gene of, in, uh, of interest, whereas this one would. So we won't be able to physically get rid of the guys that we don't want over here. But what we can do is visualize them actually on a bacterial plate and say, you know what, if we see those guys, we don't want to pick them up. If we see these guys, we do want to pick them up. Remember when we talked about bacteria growing on a plate? Bacteria growing on a plate are a way to separate bacteria, and each colony that grows comes from a single starting bacteria. So if we see colonies that look like they're blue in color, that's because that gene was intact. It did the chemistry to turn a substrate that we add blue, and the entire bacteria will look blue. We do not want these guys. However, if we have disrupted that gene, we can no longer have a gene that will make a protein that allows us to turn a substrate blue, and these bacteria will lack the blue color. They actually look like they're kind of an off-white color, and those are the ones that we want to see. So again, if you're using this blue-white screening, white colonies are going to be what you want to collect. And I'll just say this one more time. We are not using blue-white screening because all of our plasmids do contain the gene of interest. We didn't do any work where we were actually having the potential of a plasmid without the gene of interest. Okay, so kind of moving on here, I kind of want to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be doing um, with these three different experiments. So again, I'm going to start first with this concept of transformation, and I'm going to walk you through 
kind of what you're going to do in lab. Because when you walk into lab, I'll be available for consultation and question. Everything's going to be laid out for you, but you're, pa you're basically going to be doing this experiment on, on your own. I'm not going to walk you through in a pre-lab before lab to tell you exactly what to do. That's what this is right now. So when you thaw your cells, you're basically going to have a tube that you'll get that's going to be a screw cap vial that's going to have 50 microliters of what we call competent cells. These again are going to be stored at minus 80, so we're going to need to thaw them prior to our being able to use them. Now, 50 microliters is probably more than we need, and since we need to do actually two different experiments, we're going to separate this into two aliquots. So basically, you're going to take 25 microliters out of these thawed cells, and you're going to put it in one of our Eppendorf tubes. And that's going to be one tube. And then you can still use this same tube, and you're going to have a second tube of competent cells with 25 Oops, that should say microliters there, not milliliters. 25 microliters of competent cells. So one of the things that's really important to highlight here is all of this has to be done on ice. You do want, not want to have your hot little hands touch the cells. So hands off the cells because your hot little hands can actually trigger the chemistry that we're going to talk about that happens with transformation. So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen until we actually are ready for that process to happen. Okay, so you've got two tubes here, again, on ice, each one of them containing 25 microliters of competent cells. To one of them, you're going to add just your water, and then to another one, you're going to add your plasmid DNA. And we'll talk about in a minute what quantity you're going to add there. Okay, so one tube's going to get water, and then one of them is going to get plasmid. Okay, then what you're going to do is you are going to plate these mixtures after you do the transformation um, procedure. So again, this transformation procedure, which is what we have highlighted kind of over here, once you do this transformation, which is literally just heat shocking your protein, and the protocol is written out for you in your lab, um, lab handout, then we need to let the cells recover. So we're going to heat shock them, we're going to let them recover, and then we're going to need to plate the cells. Okay, so that's the uh, point that we're at right now is plating our cells. And for each situation, we're going to have two different kinds of plates, one that has ampicillin and one that does not. So each group is actually going to have four different plates. So I'm going to kind of draw them out here. So for all the plates that kind of come from our adding water, and hopefully this makes sense. This is not going to be a transformation that does anything. We're adding water. We're not adding plasmid. So for these guys over here, okay, we're just going to put 50 microliters of our transformation mixture on here, and we're going to spread it. Some of the things that I will take time to show you um, in lab is how to make the spreaders so that we can actually do this chemistry. But what we have here is these three plates really represent controls. This is not interest anything that we're interested in utilizing for a downstream kind of application. These are control plates that will allow us to make sure if something doesn't work on our plate of interest, we might be able to look to those control plates to see why. So sort of the money plate, the plate that we're most interested in, is this last plate. So this plate really represents cells that we've added DNA to, and we've streaked them on our selectable marker. So one thing that will be different actually with this plate is we're going to actually split this plate in half, and half of it we're going to do 50 microliters, and then half of it we're going to do 5 microliters plus 45 microliters of a solution called SOC. And that just means it's something that we're going to use to dilute our sample. And the reason that we do this is 
maybe this amount is way too concentrated and we're never going to have individual colonies that grow. Maybe they're going to overlap way too much. And so we're not going to be able to get an individual colony from over there. So if we have something that's essentially tenfold more dilute, maybe we could have individual colonies that would grow there. On the flip side, we don't want to just kind of do this because if our transformation doesn't work very well, we may have no colonies over here. But if we had 10 times the amount of solution, maybe we'd have the two or three colonies that we'd need. So that basically is how you're going to do this transformation procedure. These plates will incubate overnight. And so one of your pre-lab questions, pre-lab question number two, has to do with what are you going to do Friday when you come in? Because these plates are incubating overnight, before class on Friday, you're going to need to go and check your plate. Now the afternoon's lab might need to let their plate go a little bit longer depending on how extensive the cell growth is. But once your plate is finished incubating sometime on Friday, you're going to need to wrap it and then put it in the fridge. So again, that's something that you'll need to think about doing on Friday. So that's the answer to pre-lab question number two. Okay, pre-lab question number three that we have here, um, I'm sorry, pre-lab question number four is going to ask you to repeat this table. So again, you can just copy what you have here, but I do want to make sure that you understand kind of what's going on. So I'm going to flip back to this page just for a minute to remind you that we basically have two different plasmid situations, plus or minus plasmid and two different antibiotic situations, plus or minus ampicillin. So what that allows us to see here is that we have four possible outcomes for what we might see. And again, those are the four plates that we have here. So I kind of want to go through each one of these situations and talk about what we're going to see and why it's an important control. So again, we're going to save this guy for last because this is the plate that we're interested in. This is going to be the one that we split in half. This is going to be the one that has something that we'll utilize for our downstream application. So let's run through kind of these minus plasmid situations first, right? So if we don't have any plasmid and we grow the cells on ampicillin, our expected outcome is that nothing should grow. We haven't given any antibiotic resistance to our bacteria, and we've provided the antibiotic. So why this is an important um, control is that if there's any contaminants, maybe a plasmid and other solutions, if we see something grow on this plate, there might be some contaminant and other solutions. And an important thing also that's not kind of in here is maybe our antibiotic is bad. Right? If we're thinking that we're providing this ampicillin here to kill all of our bacteria and we see growth, well, maybe there is a contaminating plasmid that's in there that's affording uh, that resistance. Or maybe our antibiotic just isn't good anymore. So this is, again, going to be an important control that we make sure that our antibiotic is working properly and there's no contamination. So let's take the situation here where we have no plasmid that we've added and there's no antibiotic that's on the plate. We'd expect to see what we call a lawn of bacteria. The entire plate should be covered with bacteria. And again, this ensures that our cells are viable. So again, our cell viability is really important because if our cells can't grow, even in the absence of antibiotic, that probably means that they're not going to be growing in our money plate, in our D plate here. So again, another important uh, control that we're going to look for, if we don't see any growth on our uh, on our money plate, if you will. Maybe the cells weren't even alive anymore. So that control um, allows us to look at cell viability. So again, contaminants and then whether or not the antibiotic is viable is important with that other control. So let's talk about the last control here. Again, if we did include plasmid, so if we had plasmid in our sample and we didn't have any ampicillin, we should see, again, a lawn of bacteria. And again, the only reason that we might need to see something here is if nothing grew here, again, maybe that gene produces something toxic that prevents cell growth. So maybe there's something cytotoxic um, 
that is uh, in the gene that we produced and that could account for the fact that those cells couldn't grow. But again, what's important for us to highlight here and what I want you guys to be able to think about is what is the expected outcome? What do we expect to see on these plates? And the only time we'll probably really need to look to our control plates is if something doesn't work properly in our money plate. We hope to see individual well isolated colonies on our money plate here. And again, maybe if there's no growth that's there, maybe the cells are dead and we can look to control A for that. Maybe there's a toxic gene product and we can look to control C for that. And again, this is a gene that we know what we should see, so we're not expecting that to be a situation. Maybe there's contaminants. So again, if you've got an overgrowth of bacteria, maybe there's contaminants, or maybe the antibiotic is not working well. So again, we're going to want to make sure to look at control B to look and see that there's no growth, because if there is growth there, maybe the antibiotic is bad, and then we're going to not be able to have any separation of bacteria that contain plasmid and those that don't contain plasmid. So again, that was pre-lab question four. Basically, you're repeating this table that's there, so you can just go ahead and copy it down. But again, it might be something um, that we'll need to look to if we don't see what we want in our sort of money plate. All right, so that's transformation. So if we want to move on and think about the next thing that we're going to um, talk about. It's going to be that restriction digest. And so we call that a double digest. So again, what are we going to do? What does a double digest do? We're going to use two restriction enzymes. Remember, I want you to think about those like molecular scissors. And we're going to use ECHOR1 and BAMH1. And that's going to allow us to snip out our insert. So we're going to go back just for a second to our picture here that we had of our gene of interest, right? This is our plasmid. So again, in our multi-cloning site, which is blown up over here, we're going to have ECHOR1 and BAMH1 as restriction sites. So if we use those molecular scissors in this region, we should be able to drop out our insert that is going to be 1,722 nucleotides in size. And again, we can use a gel to be able to visualize that. So again, we're going to be able to hopefully see an insert of this size. Well, how exactly do you see it? Well, you basically run it out on an agarose gel, and you compare it to DNA fragments of known size. We call that a DNA ladder or markers, and we can sort of estimate what we see. So what is that going to look like, right? This is what we'd expect a gel to look like. I'll break apart kind of what we see on the gel here, but just as kind of a little highlight, this is what you're going to need to see and draw for pre-lab question number eight. So again, you can just completely copy it, but I want to make sure that you understand what we have here. I also kind of want to highlight the fact that this is a different sort of procedure. This is what we call an analytical procedure and contrast that to preparative. Analytical is really small scale, and we're doing it on small scale, not because we want to take what we have for some downstream function. This is really a terminal function. And often things that are analytical are used for visualization. We just want to see what's going on. That unlike you do like a TLC plate, so that's kind of a good kind of comparative analogy for what you guys may have already done say an organic lab, you want to check your reaction and see how well it's going, you don't throw your entire mixture onto a TLC plate, you take a little bit out and then you analyze it to kind of see where things are at. The same is sort of true here. We want to see what's going on with our double digestion reaction. So again, what do we have? We've got a mixture of DNAs. We couldn't really just look into the tube that we did our double digestion in and see what was going on. We basically need to separate it. So again, we need to see what's in there. We can use gel electrophoresis as a separation technique. Remembering how electrophoresis works, DNA is negatively charged, so it's going to move through a gel matrix in proportion to its size. Okay, so large molecules are going to move more slowly and move uh, much less distance than larger pieces. So I kind of want to highlight over here the different things that we're going to see. 
So what we have here first is we have two different markers. And again, that's just because one of the markers basically has sizes 1,000 through 5,000. And then this marker has much smaller pieces. So that's just something that we have two different markers to kind of span a larger range of DNA pieces. Now I wanted to highlight here, remember when you had cleared lysate and then you had flow through that we had from lab number four, those 10 microliter samples that you saved, we're going to analyze them on our gel here. Okay. Then you have kind of your eluded plasmid. That was our, our, our money piece. That was what we saved and what we're interested in from our last lab. And then what you're going to do is also analyze the double digest. So let's just take a second and break apart what we see here, right? Our cleared lysate, and remember this was stuff that didn't bind to our little mini prep column when we did our, um, our plasmid elution. And so this is all the stuff that flowed through. And so what we see here is all the little bits and pieces of, um, of RNA that got broken, broken apart. So I should say the cleared lysate was what we isolated from um, uh, the, the cells once we lysed them open. And then the flow through, that's really what we had when what was what flowed through. And so what we can see here, it's a little bit hard to see. The cleared lysate has the plasmid that we want and then the bits of degraded RNA that we don't want. After we put it through the column, the plasmid wasn't there anymore because remember the plasmid was stuck on the column. But the little pieces of RNA came through. And then after we did our washes and our cleanups and all of that, we're going to have our plasmid that got eluded. And again, there's no more contaminating RNA there. So these pieces, all three of these, were from lab number four. And then we took our eluded plasmid and you did this double digest reaction. And what we can see here is that there's a little piece that we snipped out. And it's about the 1700. And it's a little bit hard to see here. What we'll probably do is we'll run your marker on the other side. But it's close to about 1700, which is what we'd expect to see for our target insert. So often what we'll see is people will either put a marker on the other side, um, and we'll actually have you guys do that. We'll put your marker on this side because we want it to be as close as possible to the piece that we're trying to estimate the size of. So again, super coiled plasmid, okay, that just represents um, a plasmid that's kind of twisted on itself, so it's not kind of this open loop. It really is like um, uh, a circle that's kind of been wrapped on it on um, on itself, so it kind of looks like a rod more than uh, like a circle. All right, so I want to take a second here and kind of walk through for you what's going to happen um, when you do this double digest. So again, our double digest here. Okay, if we kind of break apart what I want you to think about happening in the lab is we're going to mix some reagents in with our plasmid. So I'm going to talk about what those reagents are. We're going to have water, which again we call SDW for sterile deionized water. Our water here at Mercyhurst is neither sterile and maybe deionized, um, but that's just kind of a, a typical abbreviation. We're going to have some buffer. That's a 10x buffer. We're going to have something called BSA, and I'll talk about in a minute why we have BSA there. You're going to have your plasmid DNA, and then you're going to have your two restriction enzymes. One of them is called BAMH1, and one of them is called ECHO-R1. So one of the things we want to think about is what do we want our final concentration to be for all of these different pieces? And then we're going to think about the volume that we need to use. I'm just going to move my pieces over just a little bit here so I have some more room here on my right. Okay, so first thing, we are going to do a 10 microliter reaction. Okay, the final concentration that we want to have anytime we're doing something is what we call 1x. And 1x we can think about as really being our working concentration. So when you see 1x, 1x is a working concentration. Okay, so again, we need to think about, well, how much of that buffer are we going to use? 
And maybe it makes sense to you that we're going to use one microliter. But if not, I kind of want to give you something what you need to think about. So if you're using X, right, and you have concentrations represented in X, you can think about the volume that you want going to be equal to, or the volume that you want, sorry, divided by the X factor equals the volume that you need. Okay? So if the volume that we want of our 1x working solution is 10 microliters, we're going to take 10 microliters, we're going to divide it by the x factor, and that's going to give us 1 microliter that we need. So again, the volume that we want is going to be 10 microliters. Make this the same color here. 10 microliters divided by the x factor, which is 10, equals the 1 microliter that we need. So again, the volume that we want divided by the x factor is the volume that we need. So I go through that because we're going to see a lot of things where we have x factors. And so we're going to need to think about how we um, kind of figure out the volumes that we need to use. So we're going to end up using one microliter of each of our enzymes. And if you notice in your protocol that you have, your protocol says to use a half a microliter of these. So remember we talked about the only things that you really need to write down in your notebook are things that are different. We're going to be using one microliter, which is going to be increased from the 0 0.5 microliter in your notebook because these enzymes might be a little bit old. Okay, so again, your protocol says 0 0.5 microliters. We're going to use one microliter, but that needs to be sure to be something that is written down in your notebook. Okay, the last thing to kind of highlight here, and this will lead into um, some of our other pre-lab questions, are the fact that we don't know how much DNA we need to add. Okay, so let's call this X, and then we're going to need to have some volume of water that's why. And hopefully it makes sense to you guys that x plus y needs to be equal to 6 microliters, right? And that's because we've already accounted for 2 plus 2 is 4 microliters of stuff in our 10 microliter reaction by our enzymes and then our buffer and our BSA. So the balance of this needs to be 6 microliters coming from our plasmid DNA and then water that we're going to need to add. So depending on the concentration that we have of our DNA will determine how much or little that we're going to have there. Okay. One of the things that um, the protocol is going to tell us is that we want DNA at a final concentration of 0 0.3 micrograms per microliter. So depending on the concentration that we have of our plasmid, we'll determine exactly how much we're going to need. And we'll get to that in a little bit. I think that was all that I kind of wanted to say here. The only other thing I just wanted to mention is um, we talked about BSA, right? So BSA is just another protein. And the reason we're adding some extra protein here is it's just kind of a like a, a crowder or a filler, if you will, for, um, for space here. So if we want to make sure that everything is kind of thoroughly mixed together and that we've got kind of enough space for everything, um, we're going to add this. So I'm just going to kind of highlight here. This is really just kind of a filler that we have here. It's going to take up space and ensure that everything is evenly mixed. We're not going to have some of the DNA that kind of clumps together. We're not going to have some of these other enzymes that kind of clump together. Everything's going to be well dispersed throughout our 10 microliter solution. All right, so a couple of other things to kind of highlight here. I'm going to call this experimental considerations. What if you were doing 10 of these reactions, right? If you were doing 10 of these reactions, you wouldn't necessarily want to sit there and put all of these reagents individually into each tube. 
So what you can do is you can prepare something called a batch buffer. And a batch buffer basically contains all of the common reagents. So if we flip back to our last slide, the common reagents, and I'm just going to kind of highlight them so that we have these here, common reagents are going to be the buffers and the BSA and then our enzymes. So the only thing that's really unique is the DNA, which might be unique again for different uh, reactions that you're doing, and then water. And again, water might not be unique, but if you're using different amounts of DNA for each reaction, you might, you're going to be using different amounts of water. So again, all of these common reagents, we can kind of prepare as a batch. So here's three reasons why this is important. It's efficient, right? It saves time. There's less pipetting if you don't have to put these four reagents individually into 10 different tubes. We're going to make one tube that has a combined mixture of all of them, and then we add one time that solution to each tube. And that allows us to be more green, too. So not only does it save time, it actually has some implications with accuracy and precision, right? Importantly, for accuracy, it ensures that you don't miss a reagent. If you had 10 reactions and you had to put six things in each tube, if you're listening to the radio, if somebody comes in and asks you a question, whatever it happens to be, there's a possibility you could miss adding a reagent. And then you might incorrectly think something is going on with that, um, with that reaction because of what you see. And that might not be accurate because of something that you missed. And then we've got precision, right? Precision is going to uh, be important here because it ensures that each sample has the same amount of these common reagents. Because you're kind of adding it from a batch, you're not accidentally maybe adding twice of a certain reagent. Or maybe you thought you pulled up one microliter, but maybe it actually is more like a half or two. So it really ensures that each of those samples has the same amount of these common reagents. So again, things to consider, this plus one rule. So plus one for every 10. So for each set of 10 reactions, prepare one extra set of buffers. And that ensures that the last time you add that, that 4 microliters of batch buffer, does that make sense to everybody, that it's going to be 4 microliters of batch buffer? Because we've got 1 microliter of each of those and 1 microliter of each of those. So if you don't add and make as though you were having 11, that last one might not have enough to add. So it ensures that that last batch isn't short. So we waste just a little bit to ensure that everyone is going to precisely have the same amount of the reagents. Okay, hopefully that made sense. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the last part of the experiment, which is our agarose gel electrophoresis. So I'm going to kind of go through some details for how you think about preparing this. So again, how do you pour a gel? How do we think about loading a gel? And then analyzing our gel. So most of what we're going to talk about here deals with our kind of um, pouring the gel. So when we make our gel, we want to make a 1% gel solution. And that is a weight volume concentration, which really means that we're going to have one gram of agarose for every 100 milliliters of solution. And the solution is made from 1x TAE. Okay, so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do these calculations with 25 milliliters. So let's assume that we need 25 milliliters of gel solution. I'm going to ask you guys in lab, so I want you to think about it beforehand. We've got these gel casting trays that hold a certain amount of liquid. How could you figure out that we wanted to have 25 milliliters? I want you to think about just kind of logistically how you could figure that out. But hopefully it makes sense that if one gram of agros will be used for 100 milliliters of solution, if we want 25 milliliters of solution, we'd need 0 0.25 grams of agros. And then we're going to add 25 milliliters of TAE to that. Okay, so again, if we draw a little picture here just to think about what's going on here, we're going to have an Erlenmeyer flask. And to that, we're going to add our 0 0.25 grams of agarose. And I'm going to talk about on the next page um, what this quantity is. And then 25 milliliters of our 1x TAE. Okay. 
What you're going to do then is you're going to heat this in the microwave for about 30 seconds. You're going to swirl and then you're going to repeat that heating until you see no particulate matter. So you'll be able to pick it up and kind of swirl it and see if you see you know, little pieces of solids in there anymore. Essentially, agarose is like jello. And if you've ever made jello, you know you need to add boiling water to it and you need to stir it until all of the jello is dissolved. So essentially, this is kind of like jello. Once there's no particulate matter, then you're basically going to pour it. Oops, I should say before that, not going to pour it yet. Once there's no particulate matter, then you're going to move into the hood. And this is really, really important because the next reagent that we're going to add, we want to make sure gets added in the hood because it is a known mutagen. So you're going to add 5 microliters of ethidium bromide. So why this is a known mutagen, which means it mutates DNA, it actually will slide in between the bases of DNA and it will fluoresce. So that allows us to see it. But you also want to make sure that you don't get that in your DNA. So we want to make sure that this is done into the hood. So then you're going to add your 5 microliters of ethidium bromide, and then you're going to pour it into your casting tray. And I'll have uh, you know, a moment that you know, I can kind of show you what these pieces look like when we're, when we're in lab. But for the most part, again, you guys are going to be here and uh, kind of working through all of um, these procedures by yourself. All right, so some considerations to think about with this. Do I need to weigh out or measure exactly the amount that I calculated, or do I just need to know this amount exactly? So, for example, we said that we wanted to have 0.25 grams of agros, and we wanted to add 25 milliliters of 1XTAE. Well, let me tell you, I don't want to have you guys kind of hanging out by the balance trying to weigh exactly 0.25 grams of agarose. Okay? Go in in a way uh, weigh approximately 0.25 grams of agarose. And let's see if this makes sense to you guys. Maybe somebody goes in and weighs and they get 0.278 grams of agarose. Maybe the next person goes in and they weigh 0.0247 grams of agarose. Hopefully it's not a stretch for you guys to see that all we need to do is adjust the amount of TAE that we have there. 27.8 milliliters of TAE or 24.7 milliliters of TAE. And again, we can easily measure that amount with, you know, a good amount of accuracy using a graduated cylinder. Or if you wanted, you could also use a volumetric pipette. But the point is, is more often than not, you don't need to weigh out exactly a certain amount. So more often than not, do I need to weigh out exactly this amount? Let me correct this and say, do I need to weigh out exactly this amount? The answer probably is no. But you might need to know this amount exactly. So hopefully the difference between those made sense. And again, it's an opportunity to save you time in lab, right? It's going to be much easier and take much less time to just change the volume of TAE that you're going to add rather than trying to sit there and weigh out exactly 0.25 grams. So hopefully that made sense. Okay, so let's just take a moment and think about what do you actually need to measure out or to weigh out for these two different experiments? So let's remember here from lab number four, you got some eluted plasmid. And that plasmid had a certain concentration, a certain number of micrograms per microliter. We're going to be doing two different things with this plasmid. And again, this is related to pre-lab questions 6 and 7. So I kind of want to walk through 
what are the two different things that we're going to be doing with this plasmid? And think about the calculations that we need to do with each. So let's imagine that we're doing our transformation. Okay, the protocol tells us that we need one to five nanograms of plasmid DNA to do the transformation, right? And one of the things I kind of want to highlight is this is an absolute amount. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. We need one, between one and five nanograms of plasma DNA. I also kind of want to highlight that this is a very little amount, right? That's not a lot of DNA. And importantly, the amount is very important. So again, why the amount is important is we're going to be doing some calculations with this. And so that makes this quantitative. So let's actually do some calculations with this. I'm going to kind of take and look at kind of what has been a typical concentration of plasmid. Let's say that we get 0.27 micrograms per microliter from our lab for eluted plasmid. Okay, so again, if we want to have one to five nanograms of plasmid, Let's imagine we wanted to take one nanogram. Hopefully these calculations are pretty straightforward. We've got a thousand nanograms in one microgram, and then our concentration was 0.27 micrograms in one microliter. This tells us that we need to have 3.7 times 10 to the minus third microliters. Now this is very similar to, on your lab math, those calculations, right? We can't measure out this tiny little volume of solution. So when you have a very, very tiny amount that you need to weigh out, but you can't weigh out, what you can do is you can multiply it by some scaling factor. So say 100 times and say, you know what, I could maybe measure out 0 0.370 microliters, or if I multiply that by 5, I get 1.85 microliters. So it makes sense to everybody why I multiplied that by 5, right? Because if I want to get 5 nanograms, it's going to be 5 times the calculation that I do for 1 nanogram. Those are about, uh, volumes I can measure, right? A little less than a half microliter to 1.85 microliters. I could measure those amounts, okay? So what this means is that we need to then prepare a 100-fold dilution. So we need to prepare a dilution, a 1 to 100 dilution, which basically is going to be taking one microliter of our plasmid sample, and then we're going to be adding 99 microliters of water, and then we'll be able to use some amount between 0.7 to 1.85 microliters. And as long as we know exactly how much we take, right, if we know exactly how much we take, just like we saw in the last problem, we just need to know this amount exactly. Because if we know the exact volume that we took, we can figure out the exact amount of plasmid that we used. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, so let's walk through on the flip side here. What would we do then when we're considering calculations for our double digest? So for our double digest, the protocol tells us that we need 0 0.3 microliters or micrograms per microliter of DNA. And I want to kind of highlight, just like we did over on the other side, so we'll use the same color here. This amount here is a relative amount because it's dependent on the volume of our solution, right? In this case, 
the amount is really less important. We're not doing any um, calculations. What we're really doing is we just need to have enough to see on our gel. So this is really qualitative. All right, so again, we've got 0 0.3 micrograms per microliter, which is our, what we want our final concentration to be. And then we've got 0 0.27 micrograms per microliter, which is our stock concentration. So again, we could do a C1V1 equals C2V2 calculation, and we could figure out what's the volume of our stock needed to give us the final concentration that we need, okay? And our V2 here is gonna be our 10 microliter reaction, all right? So we're gonna kinda of highlight that here. We want our final volume solution to be 10 microliters, so that's where we got that because we know our double digest reaction is gonna be 10 microliters. Okay, so this is gonna be equal to, our final concentration is gonna be 0.3, times 10 divided by 0 0.27. So let's see, 0 0.3 times 10 divided by 0 0.27. All right, so my volume is gonna be equal to 11.1 microliters. All right, so that's great. I am going to take 11.1 microliters and then I'm gonna dilute it to 10 microliters. Say that to yourself again. Does that make sense? I'm gonna take 11.1 microliters and I'm gonna dilute it to 10. Well, maybe you already saw this already, but the final concentration that we wanna to get to is more concentrated than what we're starting with. So the final concentration is gonna be greater than our stock concentration. So we cannot do a dilution calculation for this. Okay, so let's take and break this apart. Again, these are just putting that same stuff that I just wrote into kind of a typed space here. For your transformation, if you need one to five nanograms, that's a total amount of DNA. So we can use dimensional analysis to help us figure out what we need a very, very small amount, okay? The problem is it's too small of a volume to measure, so we're gonna prepare a diluted solution and use a reasonable amount from that. So here's just another way to think about how you might do that. Divide what you can reasonably measure, I feel comfortable measuring two microliters, by what you want to measure, and that will give you a dilution factor. So again, we used 100 here with, um, uh, this problem, you could say, hey, I want if I want to measure two, let's have a 250-fold dilution. That means I could use serial dilutions of 1 to 25 and 1 to 10. Hopefully, this is kind of dusting off some cobwebs from your lab math. And we can prepare the solution that we need. Okay? Again, this is just a situation because we are going to be utilizing this um, in a calculation, we do need to know exactly the volume or the, the quantity of uh, plasmid that we have. All right, thinking about, uh, again, the flip one, if we've got, if we need to have 0.3 micrograms per microliter in a 10 microliter double digest, normally we think about doing a dilution kind of um, uh, calculation, right? to give us the final concentration of DNA that we need. But again, if we imagine starting with, my example did 0.27, but if this is just showing a different um, amount, right? It says we should dilute 25 microliters of our stock to a final volume of 10, right? That should be a big red flag, right? Our stock solution should let us to realize that we're already too dilute to begin with. So that's gonna be the case for most everybody. So the solution is use the largest volume of DNA that you can right? And if I flip back here just for a moment to kind of show us uh, our situation here with this, 
Again, remember we talked about having some amount of water and DNA that would add up to six. Well, now that we've done some kind of preliminary calculations and realized we don't even have this much DNA, this is just going to be six, and we actually aren't going to use any water at all. So hopefully that made sense. Right? So those are pre-lab pre questions six and seven. And so that should actually get you through answering all of your pre-lab questions. Just going to take a quick second for the rest of our um, this presentation here and just kind of highlight the last part that you'll have to think about for your post-lab. So again, what you'll have to do on Friday, and we already talked about this, but just to, to kind of highlight here, pre-lab question number two asks what you're going to do on Friday. You need to come in and check your plates. See if they match what you would expect. Um, and then wrap the plates and store them in the fridge. Okay. At some point, we're going to need to have you come in and count the colonies on the low and high side. So if you don't have time to do that before class on Friday, or if your plates aren't quite ready, if you're in the afternoons group and you need to come in a little bit later, um, you're going to need to count the number of plates that you have here on the high side, and this is the low side. And again, you're going to count the number of colonies that you see, and that will become part of this calculation. You guys, as part of your post lab, need to calculate transformation efficiency. Okay, So what this really means is you're going to count the number of colonies that you see. You're going to divide by the micrograms of DNA that you used. So again, coming back to this, if you know exactly the amount that you um, are going to use for your transformation in terms of your volume, and you know then the exact number of nanograms that you use for your transformation. That's what's going to kind of go in this spot. And then we can talk about a little bit more in class um, this idea of recovery volume and plated volume. Okay, This is either going to be 5 microliters or 50 microliters. I'm going to flip back just for a second, way back in the beginning here when we kind of talked about what we do here. Do you see how we have this? Either we're plating 50 microliters or we're, we're uh, only doing tenfold less. We're doing that 5 microliters. So depending on whether you're doing a calculation for the low side or the high side will determine whether or not you're using 50 or 5. The recovery volume, and this is in your lab manual, but to just highlight here, this is going to be 250 microliters, so that's how much we recover the cell volume in. So it's 250 microliters of SOC. We're going to need to add 25 microliters of cells, and then whatever volume of plasmid that you have. And we can kind of revisit that once we're in kind of one of those blue phases where we have a little bit of overlap time where we have some downtime. And again, number of colonies, you literally just get from looking at your plate and counting how many colonies that you see. So again, transformation efficiency, again, this is walking through um, the same stuff that I just mentioned there. Um, the amount of DNA that you use, note that this is going to be in micrograms. So even though we talk about um, 1 to 5 nanograms, you're going to have to make sure you convert this to micrograms for this calculation. Okay. The recovery volume is the amount of DNA that you use plus the amount of competent cells, which is 25 microliters, and then the amount of SOC used in, in recovery, right? Use whatever you used in your experiment. Volume plated is either 5 or 50. And again, you have to do this calculation twice, once for the high side, once for the low side. And again, the numbers should end up being close to one another. Right, Because if you have a decrease in the number of colonies, you also have um, a, uh, a, a uh, decrease in the amount plated, so that that should um, have a corresponding um, equality in your transformation efficiency. And that is it for this monster of a pre-lab. So I know this was long. It may be something that you had to split up into kind of you know, uh, two sessions or maybe even three sessions, but that's why the pre-lab is worth so much. Um, and your post-lab should actually be fairly straightforward, having gone through all of this beforehand.